I want to emphasize that if you remember nothing else from my talk tonight, that it should be this. The crisis of migration to the European continent is of epic proportions. It's a massive humanitarian crisis. It is a genocide, a genocide that was created by the bloody hands of British and US imperialism, and that we are not speaking necessarily of migrants in this case, but of re refugees. And finally, that a worldwide response is desperately needed to this crisis. This massive displacement, this gigantic wave of forced migration, primarily from Middle East, Africa, and Asia, has resulted in the largest dislocation since World War II. Let me say that again. The largest dislocation of humanity since World War II. This crisis amounts to a war on the global working class. That the working class and progressive movement in Britain could not stay the hand of this war is one thing. To be sucked into the ideology of the right wing is another. The dust still has not settled in this recent Brexit vote, and it's complex, but we know now that the right-wing forces of racism and division prevailed in making the decision to leave the European Union. And this bodes ill for the working class movement, not only in Europe, but for this country as well. And it is mirrored here by the rise of racist Trump and his ultra-conservative followers. Get out of the UE or build the wall are two sides of the same coin. Divide and conquer the multinational working class with the issue of immigration. Use the fears about the economic crisis to turn workers against each other instead of uniting as a class against our oppressors. It is really repulsive how our enemies have used the issue <clears throat> a forced migration as an answer to the ravishing effects of the austerity measures that are sweeping Europe. The very forces who are laying off workers in London or in Detroit are the very forces that drove workers to leave their homelands. It is U US and British and NATO imperialist wars of regime change in Syria, in Libya, in Iraq, in Nigeria, in Afghanistan, and so on, that force workers to leave in the first place. Star starvation sanctions and planned destabilizations carried out by imperialism are to blame for this migration and nothing else. And we should remind the working class in the developed countries that the vast majority of people leaving underdeveloped countries do not want to leave their homelands. Let us remind them that Libya had once been a state where its resources, the very oil that the corporations go to war for, for had been nationalized in Libya and had led to making this country uh, one of the countries that had the highest standard of living in Africa. But it was months of bombing as well as the assassination of its leadership, Gaddafi, in 2011 that devastated Libya. Imperialism destroyed the entire infrastructure of this country and one fell swoop. And now Europe turns its back on the very people that it bombed or helped to bomb after creating the conditions that forced its people to leave. We have all seen the pictures published by the capitalist media. The painful pictures of waves of migrants at sea, of drowned children, of boats capsized, whose people never make it anywhere and fa whose families back at home will never know what happened to them. In the first week of June alone this year, it is reported that almost a thousand people died in, in the Mediterranean Sea. This year, over 2,000 people have died in the waters alone. More because it's summertime right now and people go out uh, when the water is a little bit warmer and that's why the numbers are so disparaging. But a thousand people over 2,000 people have died in the seas alone. And this is, all these estimates are always very conservative numbers. 
And this fact, these pictures that we see and these things that we know about the, the migrants that are forced to leave their country, of course, is very painful and it pulls at our heartstrings. But rarely do these pictures report the context of what caused this migration. In reality, comrades and friends, the people in the pictures are, not, are really not migrants at all. They are refugees and should be accorded the rights of refugees according to the United, United Way nations, which says that the number one right of a refugee is the right to safe asylum. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, this issue of, of refugee. The United Nations says, uh, and this is according to a 1951 declaration, which is of course very outdated. It's very, uh, uh, um, it was related and, and fashioned during the Cold War, and it really needs to be updated totally. But it does, says, it does say that a refugee is a person who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular group, or political opinion, and is outside of this country, of their country of nationality, is is should be called a refugee and should be uh, uh, protected. And it has been updated to say that those that are fleeing war or economically turmoil, turmoil areas can also be considered a refugee. Uh, another interesting fact is that um, Worldwide, there have been there are 19 and a half million people, and again, these figures are conservative. But 19 and a half million people have been forced to seek sanctuary abroad last year alone. And some of the interesting facts about immigration is that in that 86 percent of the world's refugees don't go to devolved countries. 86 percent of the refugees go to underdeveloped countries. So the fact that Europe and the U.S. have such a backlash shows the racist character of this anti-migrant uh, 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 trend. Just a few months ago, as we all witnessed the horror of mass d dislocation, the refugees' dire conditions worsen when the United Nations food program has exa had exhausted its funds and cut aid to hundreds of thousands of refugees that were in the refugee camps in Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, and elsewhere. It was reported that the UN agency just needed $236 million to keep the program funded for a few more months. And when you, when you compare the fact that the U.S. has spent every 28 hours since 2001, $230 million, every 28 hours, you, you see how much of the world's resources from the capitalist countries go to war instead of uh, taking care of those that are affected by war. Not that we expect um, the, the U.S. Or the, or the British to ever really make any effort to really care about these uh, migrants. Uh, last year, we remembered that 800,000 people crossed the Mediterranean to Greece that were fleeing the war in Syria. And it was, it was one of those uh, examples of why uh, the ruling class propaganda is saying that uh, this is the largest migration since World War II. Uh, a very a very interesting fact is um, is the situation for children. The 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 numbers of unaccompanied minors, much like the crisis that we saw from Central America to the U.S. a couple of years ago, that is true for uh, those trying to flee into Europe as well. Tens of thousands of migrant children have been reported. Tens of thousands have, have been reported to go missing. And they're afraid that many of these tens of thousands of children and, and uh, UN and other forces say that this number is probably very underrated, uh, that there's major fear that these tens of thousands of children have been forced to uh, uh, work camps or, or other you know, very devastating situation. So it's so another example of how this is such a, a humanitarian crisis. Um, and I want to talk just a little bit about Syria. Uh, we have 
we have heard reports that Syria has the highest number of people displaced by the war. And of course we know that's all because of imperialism. How are you supposed to stay in a country after the Pentagon and NATO have tar targeted the infrastructure, have devastated irrigation and schools and hospitals and water purification systems and, and so on? And let us not forget about the sanctions that U.S. and NATO imposed in Syria in 2010 and how this was followed by the arming and financing of mercenary forces. This war has destroyed a formerly prosperous country where the population had, had modern infrastructure, quality free health care, and free education. But now almost half of Syria's 23 million population have been displaced. More than 4 million Syrians have fled to neighboring countries. People from Western Africa are forced to leave after decades of IMF structural adjustment policies. Even the IMF itself admitted that its schemes have created disquieting conclusions. Talk about a euphemism. Um, sorry. So I want to end with, with uh, with this, comrades, um, as I said, the, the crisis of, of migration, the crisis of refugees who are fleeing uh, unstable uh, social and economic conditions that were imposed by NATO and imposed by U.S. imperialism are a crime against humanity. And so it's a crime that the uh, British working class, those that got sucked into the right wing ideology, uh, did not see that this was all about divide and conquer. And so it's very important for us to raise our demands, not only in solidarity with refugees and migrants of the world, but to say no to Islamophobia. And we should also demand reparations for Africa. Th these kinds of things are the solutions to Brexit. Reparations for Africa to demand that US and NATO get out of Syria and Libya and Afghanistan and around the world. And I also think that we should consider as the party to uh, take on two dates that may be important to help counter uh, this right-wing trend as it impacts uh, the British working class, the worldwide working class, and of course the working class movement here in the United States. And that's December the 18th, which is the World Day of Migration, and June 20th, which is also World Refugee Day. Because we really cannot sit still. And whether Trump gets elected or, or not, which is likely that he won't, nonetheless, the Islamophobic, the anti-Muslim bashing, the anti-immigrant, sexist, racist ideology that he has fed into in the society must go challenged at every term. And of course we know that Hillary Rodham Clinton is no better, and that's why we need to continue to build a moment, the momentum and solidarity with, with refugees and migrants around the world. Thank you. It said, <clears throat> the headline of the Wall Street, Journal, Wall Street Journal article was, anti-immigration sentiments have fueled political movements around the globe, from the Brexit vote to the rise of Donald Trump in the US. And then the whole article, at least, you know, from what I get out of it, and I really encourage comments to, to look at it, is saying that, that it isn't so much about um, immigration, that, that, that the thing that, much of of this anti-immigrant sentiment is is more social and more about national identity and that white workers are, are okay with the effects of globalization uh, if a cheap car is made in in Japan or um, Mexico where many Fords are being made right now but that it's another thing when that Japanese or that Mexican worker is in there mixed so remind it, so you know it, so it really showed that this was racist that they're afraid uh, uh, of the browning in, in this case in the in the US the browning of, of the US which was the title of an immigrant of an article that was written right before the anti-immigrant backlash that started here in 06. It was an article written by a Harvard scholar called Samuel Huntington. I will never forget the cover story was the Jose of America. 
and it was about the bro browning of, of quote unquote America and how uh, the, the number of white folks was d diminishing and how this was a danger to the, the national identity of the United States and hence this anti-immigrant tirade started. And so that this article that was written in the Wall Street Journal in the last few days kind of reminded me about that. Um, I also want to encourage comrades uh, to uh, Kathy, Comrade Kathy wrote an article last year uh, in September that's very important to remember. It was an article that um, uh, reported on a, a European-wide National Day of Solidarity with Immigrants and, and that just rebuked, rebuked all the anti-immigrant hysteria that was way, uh, uh, going over in Europe and tens of thousands of people marched that day and under the banner of refugees welcome here and no to the Muslim, no to Islamophobia and so forth and so on. And this is very important. It, it was in the hundreds of thousands uh, of people who came out uh, for, on a pro-immigrant basis. Um, and on the issue of the numbers of refugees very interesting. It shows you that there is a, an official formal cover-up of what is actually going on with displacement because you know if you go to a couple of sources the figures don't actually match and uh, you know, for the UN might say one thing and then Amnesty International had another figure. Now, this figure of 19 and, 19 and a half million people that have been forced to seek sanctuary abroad, that's 19 million people refugees, but then they have a pair, then they have something in parenthesis that says, this does not include Palestinians. <laughs> uh, okay, well, why don't you include Palestinians? So it, it just comes to show you that a Marxist scholar somewhere has to put the true numbers together because there there is a, a cover up and and also like another figure there, I saw a couple of sites that said that the 19 that there's 19 million refugees in the world so that means that that's only people uh, leaving war I don't know if that also includes other major factors like climate refugees, which is also a reason why many workers are being displaced right now. I don't know if that includes that or if it's just war. If it doesn't include them, that means that that figure is a, large, a, a lot larger. And then there's an, another figure in the same source that cites 19 million refugees in the world in the world that says there's 59 million people that are forcibly displaced worldwide. So, you know, it's very, it's very convoluted and very uh, unclear. Uh, and then it says at the end of 2014 that there was a record-breaking 38 million people who were forcibly displaced within their own country because of violence. So let's just say it, there's a fucking lot of people <laughs> that are millions and millions that are being forcibly displaced one way or another because of the ravages of capitalism and imperialism. So I, I just want to end with, with this. Um, last Saturday, uh, I went to Boston to speak on Orlando. And let's remember that Orlando was just about 12 days ago. And that the immediate reaction by the powers that be, by the capitalist media and so forth, in the wake of that horrendous tragedy of 49 of our LGBTQ uh, sisters and brothers and family who were killed in that uh, attack, the immediate instant reaction was all about whipping up uh, anti-Muslim hysteria, when it had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with that. This was a so-called hate crime. This, everything has shown from, from what happened that this was a brother who was being vilified for being Muslim, who was probably very closeted and just was sent, receiving messages of every day that his life meant nothing and he went berserk. This was what Orlando was really all about, but all the media, quickly turned it into uh, an anti-Muslim uh, rhetoric, which is part and parcel of, of what happened in Britain. And when I was talking in Boston, um, the, the, the comrades and the friends and the people who came to the meeting there had not had 
a chance to to really get together in the wake of that tragedy. And it was very interesting to me that one of the women who spoke was a 40, 50 year old black woman, uh, nicely dressed. She looked like somebody that was had come working from an office, you know. And she was very uh, soft spoken and she said, you know, I may be, I may seem like I'm very nice and I'm very polite and I'm, I'm very uh, quiet, but I have to tell you that I'm full of rage. I am full of rage by Orlando. I am full of rage by what happens to the Black Lives Matter movement and what is happening with the Black community. And she said, and I, and and I said, you know, one thing that we have learned in this period. Um, as a result of the ongoing police brutality, as a, a ongoing vilification that black lives don't matter under capitalism, when cops can kill, can break the spine of a young man and never see a, a day in jail, you know, that, that many of us are going through PTSD, and that's what she was saying, that she has PTSD. <laughs> and, um, it's, it speaks to, you know, the challenge of the party, I think, is that we see many movements and we meet, see many efforts to respond to the many crises. But one thing that's missing is that there is not a vehicle by which to unite and connect all the different struggles. So that those that are fighting against the terror in Mexico, which is an enormous, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed there in the last 10 years. Hundreds of thousands more have gone missing. You know, but we're, the, the Mexicanos are fighting over there and the Black Lives Matter movement is fighting over here and now Orlando will be focusing on something else. And what's, what the challenge is for us to unite unite all these different struggles and go on the offensive like Comrade Larry, you know, challenged the party to do, because that's really, you know, what we have to do. This is an election year and all the energy is being sucked into the elections. And unfortunately, much of the movement that got caught up in the Bernie Sanders m momentum now looks as if it's looking to form another election type party from the left. And that's not the answer. That's a social democratic solution to the austerity measures and so forth and so on. And so it really merits uh, uh, and demands for the party to do everything we can to elevate the struggle in the streets on a class basis. So that's the challenge of the uh, period ahead. Thank you. Thank you.